Last week I began a mini series just about the fila about prayer. And last week we covered the origins of prayer, how it came about, how today we have a prayer that is somewhat composed for us. It's organized in something called the Siddur, a prayer book. Siddur coming from the word to organize. The words are there for us, the times of the day are there for us. All we have to do is take advantage of those few moments that we have during the day and to use them properly to communicate with Hashem. What I want to do today is, is to talk about the essence of tefillah, how it is so effective, why it is so important, what it could actually achieve for us. And in the next couple of weeks, Bezrat Hashem, I'm going to share with you some stories of how a prayer did make a difference and why there are various nuschaot, there are various versions in the prayers, what the different parts of the prayers mean for those of us who have not yet had a chance to learn the Hebrew. So let's begin with the essence of tefillah, the importance or the need. Why is there a need for tefillah? What is this whole idea? Even though last week I did mention that according to the Rambam and others, it is very clear from the Torah that there is a mitzvah to say, positive commandment to turn to Hashem. It is at least inferred from the words in the Torah that there is great importance in this form of communication called tefillah. But what, is, what are we actually doing when we pray to Hashem? We are turning to Him. And it's not so much the words we say. The idea of turning to Him is important because it reminds us whenever we do so, that we're not, a, we're not here alone. There's someone above us who created the world, who takes care of the world, who manages the world, is aware of all our deeds, our thoughts. And this is an entity, God, that does not only listen to what we have to say, is not only aware, it is an entity that we can actually communicate to and connect to. So when we pray, we're basically making a statement. Just like when we cover our heads with a kippah, we're making a statement and declaring that there's someone above us that we respect and we have reverence for. That is one of the ideas behind covering one's head, that we recognize there's someone above our head, someone who's greater than us, someone who's watching over us, that we respect. Tefillah similarly is a statement. Besides the context, besides the prayer itself, we're saying that we recognize this entity, this great power, who's above us, who created the world. And he's not just the creator of the world, he actually listens to us. He's aware of what we're doing. In the past, just about every civilization, many cultures and religions had some form of prayer. They actually believed in the same form of communication that we do today. There was various ways of worship but regardless of the, of the method of worshiping God, they all recognize that there is a koach elion, a supreme being that is above everything else, that it's in our best interest to have a good relationship with him. After all, everything depends on him, whether we will have rain, whether we will have parnasa, livelihood, whether we will be healthy, how long we will live. They all recognize this. What happened over time, however, is that many of the nations of the world got mixed up with the various deities, if we can call them so, no, there's only one, and they attributed different powers to different deities, and that's how Avodah Zarah, idol worshiping, evolved. And that was a big mistake, a big mistake, an error that occurred as a result of them recognizing the powers that are in creation, the powers that Hashem, who they, they recognize in the very beginning, gave to all these entities, the stars, the planets, the galaxies, all these powers that exist out there. And after a while, they, they forgot that these are only servants of Hashem, just like the angels are. They are not the masters. They are not the ones who are in charge. We have a boss. Judaism comes into play 2,448 years after creation to reintroduce what was known very clearly in the very beginning. Shashem Echad Shmo Echad, that there's only one God. There's only one name to Him. We cannot describe Him completely. We do not see Him, but we know He exists. 
So that was the major idea, besides the Torah and mitzvot, that the Jewish nation has for ourselves, the message that we have for the entire world is monotheism. And eventually, part of that message caught on. After all, it's not a coincidence that Christianity and Islam came about. Just imagine, for a long, long time, there was no such thing as Christianity or Islam. Even the Arabs, for a long time, believed in, in, uh, in idolatry. They were pagan. So even though in the beginning, Ishmael, of course, the son of Abraham Avinu, believes in one God, eventually many of these cultures believed in idols. Until Am Yisrael reintroduces this idea and declares that Hashem is a had or had. But other than declaring this, and other than, of course, introducing or emphasizing the seven Noahide laws to the rest of the world, we obviously have a certain discipline that we need to follow. And if we follow this discipline, we will also be a light unto the nations. Besides all of that, the prayer of the Jew is very unique in that we actually believe that through this prayer that we, can, that we are communicating with Hashem, we have the ability to change mazal. The word mazal is a very, very powerful word. All the nations of the world, except for today perhaps because of the scientific revolution, scientists don't believe in many things that religion believes in. But nevertheless, most of the nations of the world, the peoples, understood what mazal is. Astrologers go back a long time. Astrology, destiny, mazal. And there was a lot of arguments amongst the philosophers of the astrologers, whether there is predestination and you can change it, you cannot change it. Even amongst Am Yisrael, the rabbis have a whole discussion about whether you can change your mazal. Is it fixed and that's it, you're stuck with it? You have a package that you're born with, how long you will live, who you will marry, how many kids you will have, the type of livelihood, the source of income, where you will end up, all part of what we call mazal. And that was a big question of how fixed is it, how, how flexible is it? Come along the Jews and say, this mazal is actually a little bit flexible. It could be changed through tefillah. That prayer that we were talking about tonight, that is a, a form of communication with Hashem, allows us to change, sometimes, that mazal. The rabbis go one step further in telling us there's actually three ways that we, one can change his mazal. If the mazal is a very poor mazal, the couple has not had children for many, many years, and they're wondering what can be, do, what can be done. Perhaps that's part of their mazal. Perhaps it's something else. Nobody knows for sure, so they first go to doctors. Then they go to tzaddikim for beracha. And then they remember, wait a minute, let's turn to him too. After all, it's, the kids come from him. That's where they should start. Before tzaddikim, before doctors, we should start with him. He is the source of everything, including kids, especially kids, as the rabbis tell us, there are various keys in the hands of Hashem. One of them, the keys of, have, the, the keys of having children. A key meaning that Hashem decides. And even though the mazal says one thing, Hashem can decide to open that which is locked. That's why the, t the key is used, the term key. So ultimately, what we're saying is that if we have the ability to turn to Hashem, to change our mazal through prayer, through teshuvah, and through tzedakah, these are the three things, tshuva, repentance, prayer, and tzedakah, charity, what we're saying is that this God does not only create the world, who actually He's actually supervising us, He's actually overlooking this world, and especially the Jewish nation, with ashgaha peratit. Ashgaha peratit means with divine providence. What does divine providence mean? That He's actually looking after us, on an individual basis, not as a whole. He actually is aware of every single Jew, every single actual cre creature in the world. But what, even though he's aware of everything, Hashgachah Pratit means that he's actually involved. It's not just an awareness on his part, he's actually involved. And he makes changes from time to time. He wants to give to us 
He wants us to have a good life. He wants us to have a good relationship with him. So he's actually looking forward to listening from us. He doesn't want us to get carried away and think only of ourselves and go about our lives not thinking of him, not remembering him. After all, for those of you who are here for the past few years, we were talking about the important mission that the Jewish nation has, the important mission that every human being has, and that is to be a servant of God. We're not here for fun. We're not here on vacation. We're not here to just eat and go to sleep and work. There's a mission to be accomplished, but people forget themselves. People get carried away, as they say in English. When you get carried away, you forget the more important things, and you unfortunately emphasize those things that are so trivial and unimportant. And one of those important things is prayer, as we will see. In praying, we're actually reminding ourselves that there is this ashgaha pratit, that God does involve himself in our life. This prayer that we just said is so powerful that it can change our mazal. The rabbis take it one step further and tell us in the Midrash that filao sa mechze. Actually, if you really want to change something, there's very things you can do. Some of you may have heard perhaps that uh, there's something called shinui makom shinui shem. People who are very, very sick, they sometimes add a name to them or change their name. Or Shinui Makom, they actually change locations just to change their mazal, to strengthen their mazal. Rabbis tell us all these things may or may not work depending on what the source of the problem is. Maybe it's not a mazal problem. Maybe they're upset at him. They're upset at him, and that's why they're holding back something or they're taking away something that he had, like his parnasa, his livelihood. It's not always the mazal, but we don't know. We don't always know. So we try. So rabbis tell us, if it is the mazal, or they're upset at you, you should know that 50% of change can be accomplished through prayer. Tfilah oseh mehtze. Tfilah, prayer, can accomplish 50% of the job. That's how powerful prayer is. Obviously, shinui maas, shinui maas meaning changing one's ways, doing teshuvah, Obviously, correcting our mistakes, all of these are important too, depending on what the problem is. But prayer, don't underestimate prayer. Prayer can do half the job. 50% can be accomplished through prayer alone. Rabbis tell us that prayer is so great that it's greater than all the sacrifices. Because if one continues to pray, even though he's not so worthy, he's not such a worthy person, but he continues to pray, he believes in his prayer, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will do chesed with him. Chesed means Hashem will be kind to him, will be generous to him, and will listen perhaps over time to his prayer. So there's a good chance that through prayer, even though this individual was not the greatest individual, was not so observant, but he, as we will soon see, he meets the conditions of a proper prayer. Through the prayer alone, he may accomplish a great deal, much more than what he would be able to do during the time we had a temple and there were sacrifices. You wanted to ask something? Yeah. Yes. In other words, if, if a, a particular request is a reasonable request, and we will see what a reasonable request is soon, through the prayer alone, if it's done properly, which I'm also going to describe what properly means, one can accomplish 50% of the job. It may require something else. See, we don't know what we need to do. People, We give charity. We pray. We accept upon ourselves something. We go to tzaddikim. We do all kinds of things to, uh, to increase our merits and increase our chances of getting something that hopefully is, is important. You know, if it's not important, then we're not going to necessarily get it. But 50% of that job can be accomplished through prayer. Sometimes it's the prayer alone that will do it, but we don't know. So we try various venues to try to, to have our requests fulfilled. So therefore, the rabbis tell us, since prayer is so effective or can be so effective, even if a person is already on the guillotine. Does everybody here know what the guillotine is? Right? They're about to, um, to um, carry out the death penalty. <laughs> right? In other words, that's his sentence to die. 
Cherev Hada, a sharp sword, is about to come down on his neck. He should not give up hope of trying to find compassion in the eyes of Hashem, of asking for pity in, to Hashem, even at the last, at the very last moment. Something can happen at the very last moment where the guy who's in charge says, stop, what did it take one second? You want an example of Cherev Chada? My sister's father-in-law. He was in Auschwitz, and they were in the gas chambers. What, how much was, was uh, still missing between life and death? In other words, what was still missing for them to Hazushalom die? Pressing the button for the gas to come down from the shower heads. You know, they were fooled to believe that they were taking a shower. So what did you take? Just a, just a button, you know, a switch. But what happened was, and I think the version of the story goes like this, at the last minute, either, I forget what it was, either they needed workers desperately, 10 workers, 15 workers, so they were let out at the last minute. And I think by the time they came out to get their assignments, there was a siren in the camp that the Russians were approaching. Was it the Russians or the Americans that liberated Auschwitz? I always get confused. Americans. Russians, I think, whatever. Anyway, the Americans came later. So uh, either way, by the time they went to work, by the time they got their assignments, before you know it, the camp was liberated. So between life and death, a few seconds, Cherev Hada, right? A sharp sword. It was just about to come down on them. Who knows what they were thinking? Don't give up hope even at the last minute. Anything can happen even at the last minute. Obviously, we don't always see such miracles. Many of us have prayed, and we're wondering when are we ever going to have our prayers answered. The rabbis tell us that some prayers are answered after a long time, some after 40 days, some after two, 20 days, some after three days. Depending on the prayer, depending on the individual, prayers are not always answered instantaneously. So therefore, don't give up hope. You never know when it will be answered. This is pretty much the introduction of the importance and the power of prayer, what it's supposed to accomplish. Now comes the big question. All right, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do to make sure that our prayers are as powerful as they can be, that they're actually done properly, that they meet the requirements of a, of a good prayer, that will have the best chances, the best chances possible to reach Hashem? Does everybody here know that if you have a cell phone that is uh, has no service has no service that means you did not subscribe it's charged with a battery it's working that if you're stuck somewhere where there's reception of course you can dial 911 even though you're not subscribed that's what i was told that's what i read does anybody know about this? I haven't tried it, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> right? That if you're stuck somewhere, there's no service. Or they canceled your service. All the companies, the cell phone companies, need to take 911 calls. It's an emergency. So it's good to have a cell phone, even if you don't have any service, as long as it's charged, just in case you're in an emergency situation. Always have it charged. If you're in some place where there's, you know, no people and you're all by yourself, of course, as long as there is reception, that call may save your life. So, we are in this world. We want Hashem to listen to us. We don't, of course, have a cell phone, but He listens to us because He needs to listen to us if we call Him making it as though it is a true emergency. 
In other words, not just a, a plain talk, not just, a, you know, how, how you're doing, you know. If we really treat this matter called tefillah, something serious, it's an emergency, it's important. I, I very much want to speak to you, right? If we treat this matter called prayer seriously, then we're beginning to, to do things right. That's step number one. It has to be something important to us. It has to be something serious to us. Then he will. He listens. He has to listen. Hashem put this into place. Tefillah. In other words, I will listen to you as long as you treat this matter seriously. So what does it mean to treat it seriously? Treat it seriously means three things. I believe in it. I believe it works. I believe that he's actually listening to me. I invest in it. What does it mean I invest? I don't rush through it. I actually spend time. Unfortunately, people every morning and afternoon and evening rush through their prayers because to them they have something more important to do. Then that's not an emergency to them. That's not something serious. It's just a burden. They have to do it. They have to. They have to. They feel they have to. Well, Hashem says, you don't, you don't have to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. If that's the way you look at it, you know, don't do me any favors. So we have to invest in it. It requires investment. And number three, it requires effort. What's effort? Investment is time. And effort means that we actually have the proper kavana, that we actually try to make sense of what we're saying. We are focused. We understand what we're saying. Effort means kavana. So therefore, if, a, if one wants to begin on the right foot, and make sure that his prayers are good prayers, he has to take this matter very, very seriously. Number two. When we speak to Hashem, we assume that there is constant service. With your cell phone, you don't always have good reception, right? With Hashem, we assume that He's listening. After all, this is what I just finished saying, that He is listening. Well, guess what? I have some news to tell you. Sometimes this cell phone called prayer to Hashem is out of service. There's no service. How could that be? Because as the prophets tell us, there are some things that are blocking. B blocking our prayer from going up there. No service. No reception. Hashem says, where is the prayer? He's praying down here, but there's no reception. There are certain malachim, angels who are in charge of prayer. That's all they do. He's taking the prayer, and they don't, they don't allow it. Why not? He's dirty with sin. The sins act as partitions, the prophets tell us, between us and Hashem. There is no partition. There's not supposed to be one. We are His children. He loves us. He cares for us. But sometimes the system that Hashem put in place, He put a system of judgment. It's called Din. Din is a, is a system set up of courts, of defense, of prosecution, all angels, and they do his job. They're automatic. He can, of course, bypass them, but he usually allows the system to work. And they're blocking. They're not taking, allowing the prayers to go up. And there's some terrible sins that, that are, of course, greater blocks than others. But the common denominator of sins is that they produce a lack of reception between us and Hashem. So therefore... If we don't remove this block, we will have sins that will accuse us and will not allow the prayer to be as effective as it could be, even though the individual down here below is crying, he's sincere, he's doing his best, but if he's full of sin, the rabbis compare it to somebody who goes to the mikveh. What's a mikveh for? To clean yourself from the, an impurity. As you're going down to the mikveh, you're holding it on, you're holding on in your hands, to a sheretz, to an unclean animal. Let go of it, then the mikveh will help. If a person goes down to the mikveh holding on to an unclean animal, the mikveh will not do any good. People come to Yom Kippur, some people to Yom Kippur, ask Hashem for forgiveness, but right after they leave the Bet Knesset, they intend to continue to step on the Torah, that they just went and kissed and begged forgiveness. It's a contradiction. How could you carry the Torah, rejoice with it, 
kiss it, but transgress it. The Torah says not to do any forbidden work on Shabbat. Here, the, this man, this individual, who may not be very, very, of course, knowledgeable, nevertheless, there's a contradiction in his, in his actions. He thinks he respects the Torah, but he's not fulfilling what it says inside. And it's his fault. It is ultimately his fault, even if he's not knowledgeable, because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Learn the Torah. The Torah says you're wrong. The Torah says that your behavior is unacceptable. And therefore, a lot of people complain, why doesn't Hashem listen to my prayer? You know, why is it so unfair? Well, how could you expect Him to listen to you if you're not doing His will? You know, it, it doesn't work like that. You know, there's no reception in that case. Remove the obstacle and the reception will become clear. Rabbis tell us that one of the individuals who's, who causes the, the greatest lack of reception is a person who, who does not study Torah. Whoever the words of the Torah are not precious to him, he never sets aside time to learn Torah. Some, few, some minutes during the day, he comes along and prays to Hashem. The prayer will be a Torah. Torah is an abomination. This man doesn't take my Torah seriously. He doesn't set aside a half an hour, an hour to learn my Torah. Why should I take his prayer? Why should I accept it? If the words of the Torah are not precious to him, then I don't want to listen to his prayer. If you look at Filat Amida, which is the most central part of our prayers on a, on a daily basis, Filash Monesre, you will find, therefore, the prayer of Slach Lanu Avinu before the personal requests. Right? That prayer is divided into three parts. The first part is praises to Hashem. The second part is our personal requests, whether it's health, parnasa, uh, or other personal needs. And at the last part of the Amida, we have the portion that deals with giving thanks to Hashem for all that He has given us so far, and He will continue to give us. So before we begin with the personal requests that are all organized there for us, we say, please forgive us. Here we're about to ask you something, ask you a favor, ask you whatever it is. Please forgive us for whatever we may have done, knowingly or not knowingly, before we continue and approach you with our personal requests. So what have we seen so far? We have seen the conditions of taking this matter seriously, the tefillah, which means investment and effort. Number two, making sure that there's no obstacle. Now we go on to the third condition. The third condition is the actual request. What are we asking of him? Hashem, can you please make me win the lottery? Who says that's something good for you? You think he wants to give you something no good? He only wants to give you good things. Maybe this is no good. Chafetz Chaim has a beautiful mashal. Chafetz Chaim says there was once a father that went to the grocer and told him, listen, when my son go, comes home from school, on his way he's going to stop off at your store, give him a few candies. I'll pay you later for the candy. Good? What do you think this grocer did? Every time the child came to him, he gave him 10 pounds of candy. Going to make some good business. The child got a stomachache. A week or two later, the grocer comes to collect his bill. He says, you have the gall, the chutzpah, to come and ask me for money? After what you caused my son? You, <laughs> you, ca you caused him some, you know how much pain you caused him? Stomachache? Sick? And you have the gall to ask me still for money? But you told me that you will pay me every time I give him candy. But I assumed you had common sense that you don't give a child all the candy that he asks. You give him a little, a few candies. He's going to get a stomachache. Now, if they were to go to a bed din, who would win? The father has a good point. The father assumed that this man had common sense. So the same thing that Hafez Chaim says happens upstairs. Hashem knows that if he were to give us everything that we desire, that is not good for us, eventually when we reach the heavenly court and we see how it was all detrimental, how it hurt us in our life to have certain things, we are going to complain to him, Hashem, why did you give me this? You knew in advance that this would hurt me. And kaviachol, in other words, if, if, it's, if, it ever, if it were ever possible that we would take Hashem to court, 
right? Obviously, we would have a good case against him. So Hashem wants to avoid this and therefore will not give us, usually not, give us something that's not good for us. The reason why I said usually, because there are times that Hashem says, you ask for it, you're going to get it. Person asking to marry a particular woman, I want her, I want her, I want her. You sure you want her? Don't look at the exterior. Be careful. Inside is rotten. Don't be taken by looks. Are you sure you want it? You want it because of her money, because of her beauty? You're going to, you're going to, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to fall for it. So sometimes, depending on the individual, Hashem sometimes lets him have it. Let's it, you know, lets him fall. But usually, Hashem does not want to, us to have something that's not good for us. So therefore, when we do make a request, condition number three, let the request be a reasonable request. Chafetz Chaim therefore suggests that in the prayer Shema Kolenu, which is a very general prayer, it's not specific about Parnassah, in Shema Kolenu, you can have anything in mind. Anybody who's still a single, you can have in mind there to get married. Somebody's sick, you can have it in mind there too. Shema Kolenu is a general prayer. So the Chafetz Chaim says, use Shema Kolenu as your guide. May all your prayers be general in nature and not too specific. Hashem, you know what's best for me. You know what I need. Please give me what I need, what's good for me. That's a very general and that's a good prayer. You can't go wrong with that. But if you're going to be too specific, unless, of course, you're asking for specific parnasah. Hashem, I want parnasah. I want a good life, good health. That's different. That's specific about things that are known to be of value. But be careful when you're asking about a particular job. Get me that job. Who says that job is for you? It's not good for you. Be general. If it's meant for me, if it's good for me, please don't allow those accusing angels to get in the way. Please remove all the obstacles and let it be quick and easy. Same thing with Shiduchim. If she's the right for me, let it be easy, let it be fast, let it be in the right time. That's a better prayer than being too specific. A good prayer, the rabbis tell us, a positive prayer is when we ask Hashem something spiritual in nature. Hashem, help me get closer to you. Help me learn how to serve you, how to be a better servant. These prayers are called filot ruchanyot, spiritual prayers, are always heard, are always hopefully f fulfilled. If they're, if they're actually requested sincerely. Hashem wants to help us in those things that are spiritual in nature, to get closer to Him, to work on our anger. Let's say somebody has a problem with anger, has a problem with jealousy. So He asks Hashem for Hashem's help to intercede, to help guide Him to be able to cope with His weaknesses. These are all spiritual matters. And in spiritual matters, Hashem does want to help. Oh, you're asking me for that? That's not something material. That's not something selfish, personal. That's actually something that you will have a, will produce a better human being. That I'm interested in helping you with that. I'm going to send you a rabbi. I'm going to send you a teacher. I'm going to send you a friend. I'm going to send you somebody that will guide you. It may be a neighbor. It may be a tape. It may be a lecture. Who knows? You asked for it. And sometimes even without asking for it, we spoke about Ashgaha Pratit. Hashem actually conducts us, guides us where we need to go, with whom we need to meet. Because it could be with that meeting of that individual, something positive may come out. Now, we always will have the free will to listen or not to listen, to refuse the advice or to heed it. But at least Hashem makes the Shiduch. He makes us meet the people that we need to meet. Now, obviously, there's sometimes we meet people who are no good. And that may be a challenge. It may be a nisayon, it may be a test. That's something completely different. A partner, who, a potential partner, I should say, who may destroy your life and your marriage. There are people like that. Very, very destructive. Very destructive. Hashem should, should spare us from them. So a person, of course, who's guided by, through, with a rabbi, with common sense, he's careful, he prays, uh, he fulfills mitzvot, stays out of trouble, Shem protects him, will not make him fall. So it's important to make a reasonable request, a request that makes sense, and not just something that is exaggerated, something that may not be in the best of our interests. Number four. 
there's a prayer that we say before the Shema. Right? We ask Hashem that He should give us the understanding to understand Him, to, to be able to follow Him, to be able to learn and to teach and to fulfill the mitzvot. But even though we ask, even though we make that request, we don't really mean it. The Chafetz Chaim gives a, a beautiful mashal. There was once a poor man that came to town that needed desperately some money. So they told him, go to so-and-so, he'll give you a loan. He's very generous. So he meets up with the, with the wealthy man at the synagogue. So the wealthy man tells the poor man, no problem, come to my home tomorrow at 1 p.m. and I'll give you your loan that you need to start your new business. The next day, 1 p.m., the poor man does not show. All right. It happens. Sometimes it happens. You know, he couldn't make it. He meets him at the synagogue. The poor man meets the rich man at the synagogue again the next day. Where were you? Oh, I couldn't make it. I was late or whatever. whatever. Can I see you tomorrow? He says, of course. Tomorrow, come to me at what hour do you want to come? 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. The next day he doesn't come at 6 p.m. He meets him at the synagogue. Where were you? Gives him another excuse. Asks him, can I see you again tomorrow? He says, of course. But don't make fun of me. In other words, don't make me wait for you. But the same thing happens over and over again. So the Chafetz Chaim says, here we're making these requests in the Sidur. We're asking Hashem, please give it to us in our heart. Make us desire. Make us want to get closer to you. That we should have the ability to understand you and to fulfill the mitzvot properly. He was making all these requests, and Hashem says, okay, I'm waiting for you. I'm going to make an appointment. Come to the Met Midrash, sit down and learn Torah, come and pray, and it will happen. I will make it happen if you do what is expected of you to do. You come to the meetings, the meetings of Shiure Torah, the meeting of Torah classes, the meeting of prayers. Come to these meeting places, come on time, and I will make it happen over time. But people don't come. They make the requests, request over request over request, on a daily basis, and they never come to the meeting. So what are we asking for? So when a person asks for something, he has to actually mean it. He has to really, really mean it. And that's what the rabbis tell us in the Gemara. That's a very, very interesting expression. The rabbis tell us a person's prayer will not be heard unless he puts his nafsho his spirit in his hands. And if you read the Gemara, you have no clue what is the Gemara trying. I mean, we have an idea. The Gemara is basically saying, be sincere in your prayer. But what kind of an expression is it? Put your spirit, your nefesh, in your hand. Anybody want to suggest what is the Gemara saying here? Unless you put your spirit, your heart, in your hand. So the Maharsha, one of the commentaries, explains a lot of people are not pe velev shave, are hypocrites. Their heart, the pe, and the mouth are not in the same place. They say one thing, and they mean something else, or they do something else. When the rabbis therefore tell us, put your spirit, your nefesh, into your hands and hold on to it, Put them in, let them be together in the same place. Be a man of action. You say it and do it. Pevelev, the heart, the, the nefesh, and the cuff, the hands, should be in the same place. You're asking for something, you're saying it, then do it. Be a man of your word. Otherwise, it will not work. So this condition is very important that when we're actually saying something or we're committing or promising, that we actually better fulfill it. Another important area, condition number five, is what the rabbis tell us in the There are various mitzvot that require continuous strengthening. Why strengthening? Strengthening means encouragement, it means reminders, it means a person has to make extra efforts. It's just part of life, the cycle of life, every day, that we have tirdot, as we call it in Hebrew. Tirdot means worries 
and preoccupations. We have to pay bills. We get phone calls. We get emails. We get faxes. We get knocks on the door. We, we get people yelling at us. We have requests from our spouse and from our kids. We have all kinds of things that entertain us. And let's use the word entertain, even though it's not so entertaining, right? It's hard. It takes a toll on people. It creates something that's known in the 20 and 21st century as stress. Have you heard of that word, stress? Stress kills. A lot of people are under a tremendous amount of stress, tension. They get heart attacks from it. Worries, anxiety attacks. Tefillah, therefore, is lost. Okay, it's time to go to Shachrit, time to go to Michal Arvid. You think a person can leave all that stress, all that routine, and now start focusing, okay, Hashem, now it's time for me to speak to you. So Rabbi Selah's tefillah is one of those things that tzricha chizuk. It, it requires that you have to really get ready for it. It requires to be strengthened. It requires you to focus. Take time. And the Hasidim Rishonim, the Gemara said, one hour before they would begin to pray, they were already preparing themselves. They washed their hands. They tried to remove all the thoughts about their business and their life away from their mind. They meditated. They used to prepare themselves, meaning they used to get ready for this moment called prayer, one hour before they would begin the prayer, just so, so they can focus because of all the distractions that take away their concentration, the proper concentration. How are they going to concentrate now? They're just going to rush through it. They're not going to have the prayer in mind. They're just going to run, get it over with, and leave and go to work. And that's a shame. Prayer, this powerful tool that we have, you're not going to use it right? Chaval. So therefore, tefillah tzicha chizuk, it requires tremendous amount of strengthening. Strengthening, in other words, effort, preparation, and focus. Number six, another important condition for a prayer to be very, very powerful, is tefillah betzibur. People sometimes pray at home. It happens. You didn't make it on time, or you're on vacation, there's no synagogue close by to you. It's acceptable. Prayer betzibur in the Bet Knesset is much more powerful. And there is a very, very good mashal that explains the difference between praying by yourself and praying betzibur. There was once a king that told two towns in his empire that he's going to come visit them. Now this is a visit that occurs only once every couple of years. So everybody, of course, wants to be... Uh, good with the king, wants to have a good relationship with the king. So what do you do to prove your your loyalty? You prepare a gift. So every town prepared gifts. The first town, however, the gifts came to the king one by one. All the citizens sent their gifts to the king one by one. So the king is coming to town, getting one gift at a time. So he looks at every gift. He opens it up, says, what? This is so cheap. I'm sure he bought it at the 99 cent store. Yeah. Ha, that's, what, that's how he gives me kavod? Takes a look at another gift. This? This he picked up second hand. I can see it was used. Every gift that came to him separately, he had the chance to take it apart. Garage sale. <laughs> What's going on? He says, How, this, is, this is their kavod to me? He was very upset. The second town heard what happened in the first town. So they had enough time to prepare themselves a little different. What did they do? They took everybody's gifts, all the gifts of all the citizens of town, and put it into Agala, into a big wagon, and they sent the whole shipment to the king. The king saw all the gifts at once. He didn't have a chance to take each gift apart. He was very thankful and appreciative and was very, very happy. When a person prays by himself, his tefillah is taken apart. It requires a lot more kavana, caution, in order for it to be impressive, in order for it to make an impression on the king. It requires more caution, more kavana, more focus. It's good. It can be very good, but it just requires a lot more effort to make sure it's good, it's good and acceptable. If a person comes to Beta Knesset, even though Kavanah is extremely important to be focused and concentrated, but if he's not so focused, he's a little distracted because he's with a Tzibur, 
His gift, his prayer is together with everybody else. It's much more powerful. Hashem does not take apart everyone's tefillah in the Bet Knesset. It's a very simple mashal. It's a very true mashal. All the amenim, all the yehesh merabah mevarach, the whole koach of the minyan, berov am hadrat melech, the, the more citizens, the greater the glory of the king is. If the king doesn't have citizens, does not have only one or two, three people, he, where is his glory? The greatest glory in Kavod for Hashem is the more people in the shul, the more tefilot. Then he doesn't take apart everybody's tefillah. That's why you're better off always praying in a shul as much as possible because even though you didn't have all the, the fact that you prayed and you were part of a minyan, no comparison whatsoever. If you pray at home, you can. You can be very powerful too, but it requires a lot more work. Most people at home cannot demonstrate that much focus. It would require a lot of work. It would require paying attention to every word, focusing, understanding the words. And people at home, you know, there's noise, there's problems. It's, it's not easy. Obviously, it's still possible, but no comparison to Tfilah B'Tzibur, when no matter how you did it, as long as you were respectable, of course, to the prayer, you didn't talk in the middle of the prayer. You didn't answer your phone. As long as you were respectable and answered the man and you were quiet and just did yours, the tefillah is much more powerful than praying by Yahid, praying by yourself. So condition number six is tefillah b'tzibur, allows for our prayers to be more effective. <coughs> time when the tzibur is praying is called an etratzon. It is a time where Hashem listens, and that is the best time and the best place to pray. Condition number seven is one of the most important conditions, but one of the most difficult ones, and that is a prayer that is accompanied with tears. Why tears? The rabbis tell us that unfortunately, after the Churban Bait Sheni, after the destruction of the second temple, the gates of, of prayer are closed, but they're not locked. They're not completely locked, they're closed. You can still somehow penetrate them. What do you need? You need tears. Or you need an axe. <laughs> the axe is the teshuvah, right? Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we use everything at our disposal. We use our tears, we use the axe, we use commitments. That can get through. So rabbis tell us if a person cries to Hashem, if he sheds tears, not crocodile tears, right? Real tears, sincere tears, warm tears, those prayers will never go unanswered. They're put away. Why are they put away? Because Hashem may not want to answer right now. As we said earlier on, there may be a reason why this is not the right time to answer that prayer. Okay, somebody, has, he's 17 years old, he wants to get married, and he sheds tears. <laughs> Hashem says, wait, stand shweya. As we say in Arabic, you know, wait, you need another two, three years. Your, your zivug is not old enough, right? <laughs> Whatever, right? So sometimes it's not the right time. But the tears produce a prayer that is at least put away in a storage house. It eventually will be answered at the right time, if it's something reasonable, of course. So the prayers will be able to penetrate because the gates of tears have not been closed. The tears are accepted are measured, are stored away. They don't go wasted. A prayer, therefore, that is accompanied with tears has a better chance, much better chance, than a prayer without tears. Condition number eight. Somebody needs something desperately, and he's already cried to Hashem, he's already asked for forgiveness, he's prayed bitzibur, he's done everything. What else could he do? Condition number eight says, you know what? There is some good advice on how to get your prayers answered. Pray for someone else that needs the exact same thing as you do. If you pray for your friend, Hashem, can you make, can you make it so that she or he will get married soon and you yourself need to get married, but you're focusing only on her or him, then your prayers will be heard first. In other words, your needs will be answered first. Assuming there are no other obstacles. Assuming there are no other obstacles, that is a very powerful way to pray. For Hashem to hear the prayer and to, of course, accept it. Because you're being unselfish. 
When a person is unselfish, there's less accusations. When you ask something for yourself, they open up your book. Wait a minute. Should we grant his wish, his prayer or not? Let's look at his book. Let's look at his record. If he's not asking for himself, then the prayer somehow makes a, a turn. It goes off on, a, on, on the side, and somehow it is able to circumvent all the accusing angels. And, and that type of prayer is more easily acceptable. Number nine, Lev Nishbar. As the Pasuk says, Elev Nishba Elohim Lotiv Zeh. Hashem does not despise a heart that is broken. A heart that is broken is different than just somebody who sheds tears. Because what are tears? Tears are ultimately an expression of an immense amount of emotion that is, is so abundant in us that it overflows and comes out as tears, as water in our eyes. So it's very powerful. It's a very intense expression of our feelings, of our emotion. That's what tears are. A broken heart, however, is even greater. A broken heart means that the person is completely humbled before Hashem. Completely. See, a tears could sometimes be selfish too. You're, you're desperate. You will easily cry for something that is very important to you. And you will say it with all your heart too. It's very, very special because it means your prayer was really intense. Kol kavod. Intense prayers are very good, very powerful. A broken heart means that a person really feels remorse. He feels broken and humble. He doesn't really deserve it. He realizes how distant he has become from the Almighty. Not depression. We're not talking about Chaz depression. Lev Nishbar means that his heart is completely broken in, in the sense that he's no longer feeling that he deserves that his prayers even should be heard. In other words, he's so sincere to the point where he realizes that I know that I'm not worthy of it. I know that I don't deserve it. And he humbles himself as humble as a person can ever be. And since prayer's ultimate goal is to achieve that kind of relationship with Hashem, where we are humble before Him, that we show our trust and dependency on Him, this is the ultimate level that a person can reach. And therefore, if that condition is present at the time of prayer, he has basically come to the almost the highest level possible of communicating to Hashem through a broken heart. In other words, through basically saying, I only have you to turn to. I have nobody else. I don't have any confidence in my PhD. I don't have any confidence in my friends or neighbors or anybody else or in all the money that I have that can help me. I know that you're the only one. It only depends on you. That's all part of an expression of a lev nishbar, a broken heart that really feels helpless without Hashem's uh, involvement. That's a very, very powerful way of communicating to Hashem, and it gets through. Hashem will not despise, the Pasuk says, Hashem will not despise this kind of an approach, this kind of prayer. Okay, next one. Next one is more of a condition of a prayer during the time of the day called Tfilat Mincha. One should be careful in Tfilat Mincha. Why Tfilat Mincha? Anybody know what's so special about Mincha more than Shachrit and Arvid? Eliyahu Navi was answered during the afternoon prayer. Why afternoon? In the morning we wake up, that's the first thing we do, is we pray, hopefully. At night we've come home from work, it's easy to pray. The hardest prayer is in the afternoon when you have to stop what you're doing. And because that's the hardest prayer of all, you may be downtown, you may be at work, you have to leave everything and excuse yourself and go to a corner if there's no shul and pray to Hashem. That's impressive. Now what do you do if you're in the airport? If you're at the airport, you know, some people are embarrassed to pray at the airport. So I've seen people go over to a phone booth and say, Hashem sefatai tiftach. <laughs> right? In a phone booth and praying, like they make believe like though they're praying. Don't make a fool of yourself. Today, all these people with cell phones that are glued to their ear, you know what I mean? Those, those cell phones that are glued to the ear. The first time I saw them, I thought they were talking to themselves. 
I thought, you know, this guy must not be, you know, all there. He's talking to himself or talking to the wall. So let them see you talking to yourself. What's the big deal, right? You go to a corner. You're on the freeway. There are Hashim, There are off ramps. Go to a gas station. And if you really feel a little bit uncomfortable, then hold a, a book in your hand, even if it's not a prayer book. At least it looks like you're not praying. You're not talking to the wall. I mean, you don't have to look like a fool. But don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. Don't let the time go by. This is the. This is so important, right? So therefore. Filat Mincha is one of those examples where if you're stuck somewhere and you nevertheless let everything go, it's impressive. Hashem says, oh, he remembered me, even though he was very, very busy. So Tfilat Mincha is a very, very important prayer, even though it's a short prayer. It's a time of the day where somehow the prayers may be more effective in getting through. Number 11, Lashon HaKodesh, even though the Alakha says you can pray in Chinese. Yes, Hashem understands all the languages. The Malachim also understand various languages. The, the best language to pray is in Lashon HaKodesh. And I spoke briefly about it last week. And maybe we'll elaborate a little bit about it in a couple of weeks from now. Why certain portions of our prayer are in the Aramaic language and the rest is in Lashon HaKodesh. You will have to remember one thing. When the Anshek Knesset Agdola put together this prayer for us, they used tremendous kavanot and yehudim, as it's called in the Kabbalah. They had tremendous ideas in their choice for words and in the order that they placed everything, that if we say those words in that order, even if we don't understand them, they're still very powerful. That's how powerful those words are. They came from Anshek Neset Agdola with tremendous kavanot and yehudim in their choice of words, that even if we don't understand them, they're powerful. However, since we said all along that a prayer is much more effective if we understand what we're saying, and we are focused and concentrated on the words, then it's only in our best interest that we understand at least a little bit what's going on. So therefore, what is advice for those who are beginning their first prayers, they just did Teshuvah, or they just converted, sincerely converted to Judaism, is that they should say, they, they may say some of the prayers in their language of their choice. So at least they're, they're getting started, and at least they understand what's going on. Eventually, however, they should make an effort to learn Lashon HaKodesh, to learn the Hebrew language, so they should be able to pray in Lashon HaKodesh, which is much more powerful than any other language. And last but not least, number 12, very important idea. Rabbis tell us, even though it's very good and very special when a person prays to Hashem when he's in distress, it is always better for a person to anticipate, to pray to Hashem before the tzara ever happens. Let's say somebody is earning a half a million dollars every year. That's a very nice livelihood. I'm talking about net, not gross. But even gross is not so bad. Right? Net! Half a million, that's a nice living, right? Half a million dollars after taxes. Very good. Okay. So he comes to the he comes to the Berakha Barechenu, Barechalenu, which has to do with the Parnassah. Oh Hashem, I have it. I don't really need to pray that much here. Chaz v'shalom. Person is healthy. He's slim. His, uh, his uh, blood pressure is perfect. 120 over 80. Right? Everything is just right. Refainu Hashem and Why should he have his mind focused on the prayer that deals with health matters and doctors and healing? Rabbis tell us, be careful. You're better off praying now that you should always be healthy, that you should always have parnasa, and not having to wait till you actually need a prayer because you're unhealthy or you need parnasa. Your prayer can be much more effective and helpful before the tzara, before the distress. Once a person is in a distress situation, once he's in trouble, the prayers that he needs to get out of the trouble need to be a lot more powerful than before the trouble ever surfaces. Don't wait for the trouble to arrive. And then, Hashem, please help, I beg you. Why didn't you beg me and pray to me when you were okay? Those prayers I would have stored away. They would have, you would have had all the credit from all those prayers that would have safeguarded you and avoided all these this problems that you're having now. 
A person, therefore, should always pray for health, that he should always stay healthy. Should always pray for Parnassá, that he should always have Parnassá, even if he has it now. It should not be taken away from him. You should always pray for, for him to have everything that he needs, even if he has it now. It's always easier to pray before the trouble than after the trouble. Once the trouble arrives, once a person is sick, once he's in the hospital, and now he has everybody saying Tehillim for him, it's much more, hard, much more and more difficult. Pray that you should never come to that. It will be easier for your, that prayer to be accepted than after you're in trouble. Then you need a lot more work to get through. Okay, now that we've gone through the conditions, let's just spend a few minutes on what does one do if he tried everything and nothing worked, nothing is helping him. What now? What should he do? Is there anything that one can do if he's tried everything and nothing helps, seems to help? First of all, the rabbis tell us, number one, a Jew never gives up hope. Ali Tyesh, never give up hope. Kavel Hashem, always be hopeful, always look forward. Always remember that if Hashem did not respond today, He may respond in the near future. Never give up hope. So number one, even if nothing seems, seems to help, remember everything is for the good. Hashem did hear you, but for some reason did not answer now. So don't give up hope and continue to pray. Don't say, okay, I've done it for 40 days. That's it. No more. <laughs> continue. Don't give up hope. Continue. Never give up hope. You never know. Also remember that when a person is really, really in great need of something, The prayer of the one who is sick is much more powerful than the prayer of all those who are asking for him. You know how it is important to say Tehillim, especially if thousands of people are saying Tehillim for a sick child? There's no doubt that Bashamayim this makes an impression. No doubt about it. It has helped a lot. I heard the story recently when the Israeli army went into Aza in the latest uh, in the latest battle called Oferet Yitzuka, cast lead. You may have heard of it. Incredible story how some soldiers saw as they approached a home a woman who warned them, "Don't, don't come in. The house is rigged with explosives." She says, "Who are you?" I'm Rachel Imenu. I'm Rachel, your mother. They went to the next house, and the same woman appeared again. How did you get here so fast? Obviously, Rachel Imenu. They weren't sure, but they didn't want to overreact and nevertheless go in. So they checked, and sure enough, they did see that she was right. It was all rigged with explosives. Rachel Imenu. At the third time, I think it was, when they met her again, they asked her, what's going on? She says, I was sent to you because of all the prayers of Am Yisrael for your success. All the Tehillim that has been said, and all of us who were following this latest confrontation, perhaps you may have seen how much Tehillim and how much Achadut and how much unity was displayed in order for these soldiers to be successful in their endeavors. So it was a tremendous amount of outpour of prayer of Tehillim that resulted in tremendous open miracles for Am Yisrael, for all of Am Yisrael, not just the soldiers. So it is true. It is true that prayer that is being said in public, prayer that is said fervently with tears, Tehillim, Achdut, Tfilot, fasting, Teshuvah, obviously it helps. But nevertheless, come along the rabbis and tell us, Yafat filata chole. The sick man's prayer is more powerful than all of them. Why? Because that's why Hashem made him sick to begin with. He wants him to pray. Rabbis tell us, why did Hashem make our, our mothers sterile? Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, in the beginning couldn't have kids. Hashem says, I've given them wealth. I've given them beauty. I've given them everything. If I were to give them kids, they would never pray to me. Hashem wants the prayer of the tzaddikim. Hashem wants the one who is sick to pray to him. Otherwise, nobody would pray if they had everything. So ultimately, if the man is sick, his prayer is what Hashem wants. Oh, everybody else's prayer is very much welcome, very necessary too. But Hashem says, your prayer, if you turn to me sincerely, I'm going to listen to you before I listen to anybody else. 
So therefore, one has to know that if things are terrible, continue to pray because if things are really, really bad, Hashem wants you to pray. That's maybe what He's waiting for. Which leads us to the story of Hannah and Penina. All of you heard of Hannah, who couldn't have children. She was very, very sad because her, I guess her, I don't know how you would call it, the second wife of her husband. There's a name for it. The co-wife. <laughs> the second wife, Penina, was having many, many children. And Penina made fun of her. She somehow... Uh, what was the word? Jive. Jive, yeah. Basically, you know, saying all kinds of remarks that were not very sympathetic of her. Look at you, you know. Yeah, you know, she she basically was not too kind to her. But rabbis tell us she meant it Lashem Shemaim. What was Lashem Shemaim for the sake of heaven? She wanted Hannah to pray, to really pray to Hashem, because her prayer would be much more powerful than anybody else's prayer. What happened in the very end? Two things happened. Hannah did, in fact, at the end have a child called Shemuel, and Penina lost her children. One after one, her children died. Why? She meant L'Shem Shamayim. I just said that she actually intended what she did was intended L'Shem Shamayim. The problem was what Pnina should have done is not Chaz Shalom inflict any pain. You have no right, no matter how much you meant for the good, to inflict pain to cause any pain on another human being. If she really cared about Hana, she should have prayed for her too. She didn't pray for Hana. She should have asked for Hashem to answer Hannah's prayer. She should have prayed for Hannah. That she didn't do. But what was it that Hannah did that eventually produced Shemuel? Hannah did something very, very powerful, which is one of the most powerful things anybody can do to get his wish granted. Again, not 100%, but the most powerful of all, she did it. Hashem... You think I want a child for myself that I can nurse? That I can have take care of me when I'm a senior citizen? That I can hold and cuddle and love? No. I want a child that should be your servant. This is for you. And if you give me a boy, he will be an Eved Hakim, an Eved Hashem. He will be completely devoted to Torah, to Avodat Hashem. Of course, I'll see him. I'll take care of his needs. But this is only for you. Hashem heard her prayers. And Shemuel Navi was born. And I asked the question, why didn't Hashem give her Shemuel years ago in the very beginning? Was she such a bad person that she had to suffer? And finally, after this, ter this incredible prayer He gave her, why didn't Hashem give her this in the beginning? You know why? Perhaps. Had she not prayed for that kind of a son, we would not have a Shemuel Navi. She would have had a little child like everybody else, uh, a Moshe, a Shimon, a Shlomo, a Yitzhak, a David, going to school, being a good Jew, but not a Shemuel Hanavi. You know what Neshama she was able to bring down into this little baby, to this child, as a result of her prayer and her kavanot, were completely pure Lashem Shamaim? Shem says, yes, now you will be able to bring down a child, but not only a child, a tremendous prophet, Shemuel Hanavi. So Hashem says, I'm not going to give it to her right away. I know she's capable of bringing down a great neshama. That's what I want her to do. Not just to have an ordinary child. Ordinary children, we have a lot. Baruch Hashem, good children. Everybody has, Baruch Hashem, good children. But to produce a tremendous neshama, a leader, a prophet, like Shemuel Navi. So what did she do? She committed herself. She took upon herself something. And this is what the rabbis tell us. Stay away from making promises. Because you may forget them and then you will be guilty of making a promise that is unfulfilled. Very risky and dangerous. Therefore, always say, Beli neder, with one exception. You're drowning in the sea. And no one is coming to help you. There's no lifeguard. At that point, nodrin be'eta sakanad. Yes, make a promise. Make a neder. That's the best time to make a neder. Because that neder, that promise can save your life. When a person is in danger, when he has no way out, make a commitment. And I tell this to a lot of people who are going through terrible, terrible situation, terrible health, cancer, whatever you want, the worst. Says so you have no choice. This may be terminal. 
this may be it. You may only have two weeks to go to live. You only have one choice left. One, not going to Mexico to try alternative medicine. No, that may be a waste of your money and your time too. Not necessarily. Your best bet is to turn to Hashem Hashem. You know what? I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to take upon myself something now that if I recover, whatever I have not been doing that I should be doing as a Jew, I will begin doing now. Whether it is a woman to cover her hair, a married woman, whether it is to observe Shabbat, whether it is to eat kosher, whether it is put on the filin, everybody knows himself and knows what he's lacking. If it's a real powerful mitzvah and a real sincere commitment, that commitment has the ability to be to cancel all the terrible decrees against him, to annul, to make void anything that was decreed against him. Just like that, it can go away. That can do it. That's the only thing that can do. That's the only thing that's left. So, in other words, Hanad basically did that by making a commitment of sorts that this child would be devoted to the service of Hashem and not for her. She will not be able to have him at all times in her home. He will be in the Bet Hamikdash or in the in the Mishkan at that time. That is a tremendous self-sacrifice of her. It was a commitment, and she kept it, of course. So she did not think of herself. She made a commitment to Hashem, and it worked. Tefillah, as you know, is called avodah. It's called the service of Hashem, because ultimately it leads to one becoming humble before Hashem, subservient to Hashem, and that's why it's an avodah shebalev. It is a true service of the heart. And if a person really prays to Hashem with all sincerity, he eventually becomes a different man. The rabbis tell us sometimes a person's mazal is changed, not because Hashem changed his mind. Hashem doesn't change his mind, Hashem. But because the man changed. So his mazal changes. He's a different man. The, the prayer is such a tremendous service, such a tremendous avodah, it changes, man. It changes one. It, tr- it produces a tremendous amount of humility. And that's the ultimate goal of the prayer. It is important for one who has not had his prayers answered to, to try, besides making commitments, go to tzaddikim, their prayers are, are heard to. I'm letting you know that, that that commitment is one of the most powerful ones. But nevertheless, it is a good idea to go to tzaddikim. Their prayers are heard. To pray l'shem shamayim for the sake of heaven. And to remember everything else that we've said before, all the other conditions are important. The rabbis tell us, Iyun tefillah is one of those items, one of those mitzvot, that actually will reward one in this world, besides the reward that is waiting for him in the Lama What's Iyun tefillah? That you take your time in looking at the words, in saying them correctly, having their proper concentration in Kavanah. That's called Iyun tefillah. Not with any expectations, Chaz from Hashem, but actually taking your time. So Rabbi tells Iyun Tefillah is one of the things that you will be rewarded down here because you know what? Besides the reward for the mitzvah in Olam Abba, your prayers will be answered. You actually will be rewarded. This man, Bashamayim, they're saying he's careful with every amen. He's careful with every minyan. He's careful with being respectful. This makes a tremendous difference in how they relate to him. All to his credit. So that's called Iyun Tefillah. It produces a Sechar, a reward in this world too. i just like to end that every Jew should remember the, what the Torah tells us about Yaakov. What's the strength of Yaakov compared to Esav? Hakol, Hakol Kol Yaakov by Yedayim Yedayi Esav. The greatest Koach of Yaakov is in his Kol, is in his voice, is in his prayer. That's something that we have that the Goim don't really have. They can pray to Hashem too, of course. But that prayer, that koach that we have, they don't really have. That's a tremendous koach, a tremendous tool that we have, that if we do it properly, and filato chozeret rekam, the rabbi tells anybody who prays to Hashem properly, his prayer will not be unanswered. It somehow at some point will be answered. It is important to pray for those who do not know how to pray for themselves, those who are not observant, May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring all of Am Yisrael back with Shuva, even though there are some Jews who are not religious, not observant. Don't look down at them. Pray for them. Instead of being negative and critical 
of all these people out there who are not like you, do what Peninat should have done towards Hana. Pray for him. You have somebody that's giving you a hard time? Feel sorry for him. Oh, don't just complain. Don't be bitter about it. Hashem, perhaps you can change his heart. Perhaps you can help him. Right? Itamu hataim, not chotaim. We have to pray that the hataim, the sins should be terminated, not the sinners. We have to pray that all the sinners should return to Hashem. Have pity on them. Pray that every Jew should do teshuva. And last but not least, the most important prayer of all that we should never, never, never forget amongst all our prayers that we have, and we have many requests, let's not forget the most, in prayer, more than, most important prayer of all, which Anshek Neset Agdola put into the prayer book so we should not forget. Right? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu should come back to, to, to Tzion, that Mashiach should come, that we should all be redeemed. Amen.